Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? I hope all my Canadian viewers had a happy Thanksgiving. My name is Jordan Davidson, and this is Behind the Bench. After a one and one split to start the season, the Mississauga Steelheads get some help on the front end and the back end. Defenseman Ethan Del Mastro and forward Owen Beck both returned from their NHL camps. We have a pretty full roster. Isaac Enright uh, was out this week with an injury that he suffered in the Sudbury game. Uh, so uh, we did not have him this week. Uh, but uh, still, a very full, very tough roster to face a couple of Western Conference teams. Uh, Erie Otters came into town uh, on Friday, and then the Steelheads went to Owen Sound to take on the attack on Saturday. Here is the recap of those two games. So this is apparently the bus the Erie Otters uh, got here on. Uh, a little mysterious, the bus doesn't even look like it's from America. Uh, that's a .ca website on the side there. So, uh... Kind of makes you wonder, maybe they have a Canadian bus on hand, but uh, a little bit weird. Of course, the Blue Jays started their wildcard playoff series with the Mariners again uh, this afternoon, so just a little catch up before we go into the rink. Of course, this is the other way I'm keeping up with the Blue Jays while I'm in here. Uh, yes, I've been lapped at many times because I have an old school Walkman, uh, but hey, there's no buffering, there's no huge data rates. It works for me. So Alessio Beglieri in net for the Steelheads, Nolan Lalonde in net for the Erie Otters. Uh, they arrive on their uh, Canadian rental bus. The Star Spangled Banner and O Canada are played. First time we heard both those songs at a Steelheads game in a while. The puck drops, and this game gets underway. In his first game back, Ethan Del Mastro makes an impact uh, early. Uh, maybe not the way he wanted. He takes a roughing penalty, and the Steelheads are down on the penalty kill early. And then uh, just near the end of the penalty, it is the Erie Otters' Liam Gilmartin. Scoring his first goal of the season, give the assist to Elias Cohen and Christian Cairo, and the Otters are up one to nothing on the power play goal. Not a whole lot else happened in the first. It was a pretty defensive period, uh, which the Erie Otters led in shots uh, seven to four. Uh, so we go to the uh, second period, one nothing. There was a lot more action in the second, and it's very early in the second period, just the one twelve mark, where Luca Del Belouz unleashes a bullet of a shot that Nolan Lalonde cannot see or stop. It finds the back of the net. Luca gets his first goal of the season, give the assist to Zach Lavoie and Parker Von Richter, and the game is tied at one. Now there was a bit of an oddity in the middle of the second period, pretty much the exact uh, 10 minute mark actually, uh, involving uh, Erie goalie Nolan Lalonde. There was a bit of a collision near his net, and he got his skate blade knocked off. And in spite of the equipment manager's attempts to reattach the blade, I guess there was a little bit of pressure while people were waiting. Uh, the rest finally said, we can't wait any longer. Uh, you gotta do that on the bench. So Lalonde had to leave the game and uh, backup goalie Marshall Nichols had to come in for about two minutes. He stopped the one shot he faced, and once there was a break, uh, Lalonde was able to return to the game. So, a uh, bit of an oddity, uh, equipment issue, uh, resulted in the removal of the goalie for a couple minutes, but uh, nothing significant. Not long after that, on the other end, uh, the Erie Otters' Caleb Smith objected to a hit that Charlie Callahan made on his teammate and decided to start a fight. But uh, when you're that retaliator, that's usually gonna get you the instigator penalty. So uh, they went at it for a little bit. They both went to the box, but it was Caleb Smith getting the extra two and the 10-minute uh, misconduct. It was a bit of a fun scrap to watch. Uh, they pretty much both held their own, uh, but it did result in a Steelhead's power play. After just that single penalty in the first period, uh, in addition to that fight, uh, there were a ton of penalties in the second period. Um, like Kai Schwinn took one, Dylan Gordon took one, Owen Beck, Parker Von Richter. Uh, lots of penalties on both sides. It was one eerie penalty, a tripping call on Kerry Terrence uh, that would change the game late in the second, though. It was just over a minute after that trip by uh, Terrence uh, that James Hardy, at the 1736 mark, absolutely rifles a shot past Nolan Lalonde. You know, if I tried to stop that shot, I wouldn't be walking today. Uh, James Hardy scores his second goal. Assists to Chaz Sharp and Ethan Del Mastro, and it gives the Steelheads a 2-1 to -one lead near the end of the second. The second period ends with the Steelheads shorthanded again after a Charlie Callahan trip, but they lead 2-1 to -one after two periods. Now, after the ton of penalties in the second period, the third period is relatively tame again, but there was a Steelheads penalty that may have affected the tying goal. Xander Vecchia took a boarding call at the 546 mark. It was just a few seconds after he got out, so not technically a power play goal. Uh, but uh, he hadn't quite had time to join the play yet. Uh, Brett Brissett was able to beat Alessio Beglieri to tie the score at two, give uh, Sam Alfano and Kerry Terrence the assist. The Steelheads thought Beglieri was run into, 
so they uh, asked for a challenge, and they did challenge, but after a lengthy review, the goal stood, and the game was tied at two. Not much else happened in the third. Kai Schwint did take a high sticking penalty with three minutes left, but the Steelheads were able to kill that off. It remained 2-2 at the end of the third period, so the game went to overtime, and overtime also solved nothing. So we had our first shootout of the 2022-2023 season. Now the real hockey uh, portion of the game would end with the Erie Otters out shooting the Steelheads 37-27 to the first time in the young season the Steelheads have been outshot. A little bit uncharacteristic if you look at uh, this season and last season as well. Uh, but doesn't matter. We came out of uh, the 65 minutes with a tie, and now all that mattered was the one-on-one -on -one shots that would follow. Luca Del Babalus is the first shooter for the Steelheads. He dekes. He takes a shot, and it dribbles in through the bottom, and the Steelheads are up 1-0 in the shootout. Erie's first shooter is Christian Cairo, the younger brother of the St. Louis Blues' Jordan Cairo, who was a former Sarnia Sting. He takes his shot on Alessio Beglieri, but he is turned away, and after one round of the shootout, it is still 1-0 for the Steelheads. James Hardy up next. He had a goal in the game just like Luca did. He wanted a shootout goal in the game just like Luca did, and he got exactly what he wanted. James Hardy scores as well, and it is 2-0 in the shootout. So the Erie Otters' next shooter, Elias Cohen, had to score uh, to keep the shootout alive for the Otters. Uh, but he is turned away by Alessio Beglieri as well. So the third round of the shootout was not necessary. I think our third shooter would have been Owen Beck. But uh, in any case, it is the Steelheads coming away with the shootout win and the win in the game, a 3-2 final. Anyway, here is the Three Stars presentation and the post-game interview and a few clips I took after the game. I gotta get wet now. Oh, Woo! Mike, that working? And and uh. <laughs> Love the bromance. I'm actually dogging. Got you. Okay. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's been asking everybody. He's trying to get Freighter to kill all you guys. <laughs> hey, you went back in there. Come on! <laughs> That's the two, second time we've done that. Mike, you ready? <laughs> yeah, got you. <laughs> oh, that was your first. Welcome back, dude. You always do papers in there. Thank you, bye. How was I? Big tough reporter here. <laughs> 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 Put in the comments what you think they're looking at. <laughs> oh, chick. Best answer gets a heart. What's <laughs> parachute? like, started looking at the sheet, see, see who's left. Uh, oh, it's this guy. Thank you guys. Good night. So, with the win against the Erie Otters collected, the Steelheads would uh, go back in action the next day, making the trip north to the coast of Georgian Bay, where the Owen Sound attack await. I made the drive up to Owen Sound at pretty much the same time the Blue Jays were playing their do or die game two uh, in their wildcard series against the Seattle Mariners. They dropped game one the previous night. 
Uh, so they had to win to stay alive. I actually had to take us to game three the next day uh, if the Blue Jays had won. And uh, during the duration of the drive, uh, it actually sounded pretty good for the Jays, but uh, you know what happened. <laughs> anyway, once I got there, I did take a few clips of the outside to show you. Enjoy. Well, here we are, guys. Uh, Jordan Vlogs' first look at the Harry Lumley Bayshore Community Center, which is the home of the Owen Sound Attack. Harry Lumley, of course, a uh, successful NHL goalie from the area uh, who played in the 40s and 50s, I believe. Um, and if you want to know where the Bayshore part comes from, well, let's just take a walk over here. See, there's the arena over here, and over here, look at that view, right on Georgian Bay right here. Ducks just chilling there. Uh, I remember one of the first times I came here, um, you know, it was like early in the season, kind of like it is now. Um, and after the game, uh, you know, I'm greeting the guys at the bus like the shy guy I still was at the time. Um, and I see the Owen Sound players come out uh, in their bathing suits and they go out for a swim. So that was one of the cool things uh, from my early days as an OHL fan. Uh, but yeah, very nice area. Uh, it's a nice rink once we get inside. Uh, hope to show you more. Now, you know, right before I got here, uh, I saw this vehicle uh, pull up behind me on the road, uh, kind of looked like this. Um, you know, it's like they were driving to a hockey game or something, and you know, uh, they had to get here like they were the stars of the show or something, you know. Really weird, right? I didn't get a lot, admittedly, once I was inside, because I will admit the uh, baseball game on the concourse was a huge distraction, so I spent a lot of, you know, warm-ups in the pregame uh, just watching that, and... Uh, it was right before the hockey game was about to start that uh, the collision between Bichette and Springer happened, uh, which uh, knocked Springer out and also allowed the tying runs to score. So that was a very weird note to uh, go down to my seat and start watching hockey on, but uh, I did wish the Blue Jays luck. It was still tied at that point, and I went down to cheer on my steelheads. Alessio Beglieri started in goal again after a strong showing the previous night. Uh, the goalie for the Owen Sound attack was Corbin Voteri. Now, there was a, a moment in the middle of the first period where the Steelheads thought they had scored, but it was waved off right away due to goalie interference. Uh, so much like uh, the play last night where JR wanted the goalie interference call uh, against Erie, uh, he challenged again uh, to get the goalie interference taken off and uh, let the goal be allowed. But uh, again, after a long review, the challenge was unsuccessful and it remained a scoreless game uh, through to the end of the period. Uh, despite the Steelheads dominating the shots, uh, they were up 14-3 to on shots after one but no score. Now, when I got back to the concourse after the first period, uh, the Blue Jays game was still going on. Seattle had taken the lead to that point, and it was 10-9 uh, Seattle going into the bottom of the ninth. Here is my reaction to the end of the Blue Jays game. Oh, oh, oh no. It's over. It's over. Yeah. Huh. Well, well 160 dollars refund tomorrow. We'll see you after the second. Yeah. Just a reminder, folks, there's still a hockey game going on today. Standing next to me in the concourse uh, watching the Blue Jays game happened to be the mom of uh, Steelhead's assistant coach, Jeff Kierzakos, and she happened to mention that Jeff had game three tickets as well. So I'm sure, uh, you know, they arrived at the arena thinking the game was in the bag, and it probably came as quite a shock when Jeff realized he wasn't going there anymore. <laughs> So yeah, that was probably the worst possible way for the Blue Jays to bow out. Uh, I don't regret being at the hockey game because it was a very nice distraction. Um, and of course, the credit card refund for Game 3 also helped. Uh, but uh, on that note, we went into the second period. And that's where the Steelheads started to uh, make their mark. And it was at the 7.16 mark of the second period that a point shot from Parker Von Richter found the bottom left of the net and went in. First OHL goal for Parker Von Richter. Give the assist to Charlie Callahan and Lucas Carmiras, which is also his first OHL point, and you can make it 1-0 Steelheads. Now this is one of the reasons I love sitting behind the bench. Uh, you know, Parker stayed on the ice after the goal, but uh, when he did come back, uh, you get to see that little exchange between JR and Parker and, you know, putting his arm around him, congratulations, that kind of thing. Uh, I know uh, JR has known Parker for a long time. He's a former Billa brother of the Steelheads. Uh, his family hosted uh, Former Steelheads defenseman Stephen Gibson when he was here, uh, and they wore the same number. Stephen Gibson wore six, Parker Von Richter now wore six. Uh, and just one of those cool moments that you can only see behind the bench. Steelheads found themselves on a power play midway through the second period when Ben Cormier of the attack took a high-sticking call, and it was on that power play, another point shot, this time from a veteran defenseman, Chaz Sharp, 
beating uh, the goalie uh, Corbin uh, Boteri. And uh, this one made it 2-0 Steelhead to get the assists to Ethan Del Mastro and Luca Del Belbeluz. Make it 2-zip. Game did start to get a little rough near the end of the second period. Uh, Nolan Seed of the attack uh, got tangled up with Bryce Cook. Uh, they uh, tussled for a bit. They didn't quite get into a fight because they were broke up early. Uh, so they uh, both got roughing penalties, but Nolan Seed got the double minor for roughing. We did get a power play, but nothing came of that. It was still 2-0 Steelhead after 2. Shots, by the way, I mentioned there were 14-3 after 1. The shots in the second period alone were 22-6 for the Steelheads uh, for the two-period total of 36-9. So we were pretty dominant in that way. <laughs> I have to say, it was one of the most somber hockey crowds I've ever seen. Yeah, I know, I know they just watched the Blue Jays lose, and now they were basically watching their home team do nothing. So, uh, I was happy for my team, though. To the third we go. The Steelheads' dominance did not stop there. At the 10.53 mark of the third period, uh, Corbin Boteri was beaten again. Now, it was announced in arena as Kai Schwinn's goal, and I thought it looked like Kai Schwinn's goal. Uh, Kai Schwinn celebrated and all that, but apparently upon review, uh, Zachary Lavoie may have tipped it because the goal is now credited to Zachary Lavoie, his fourth. Uh, Kai Schwind does get the lone assist on it. Either way, it was 3-0 Steelheads. Not long after that, at the 11:25 mark, there was a little more chirping uh, between the two teams. Nolan Seed getting into it again, this time with Ethan Del Mastro. Uh, Madden Steen of the uh, attack also getting involved. They all got penalties. Uh, Del Mastro and Seed for the unsportsmanlike conduct, and Steen uh, for a little bit of pushing. He got a roughing penalty. And once again, the Steelheads were on a power play. Instead, the Steelheads collectively would keep putting it on the net and keeping it away from their own net. Uh, Owen Sound would eventually pull the goalie, and it was Mason Zabeski getting his first OHL goal into the empty net, give the assist to Xander Vecchia, and that made it 4 0 at the 17 38 mark. And 4 0 is how it would end a big win for the Steelheads and a big milestone game for a lot of players. Parker Von Richter with his first goal, Mason Zabeski with his first goal, Lucas Carmeris with his first assist. And the first OHL shutout for Alessio Beglieri. Give some credit to the defense on that. He only had to stop 14 shots. But a goalie doesn't choose how many shots he has to face. A shutout is a shutout. Give credit to Beglieri as well. Here is the three-star presentation from that game. I personally thought the uh, selections were a little puzzling. Uh, of course, the goalie who got the shutout didn't get one, and none of the Steelhead's goal scorers got one, uh, which was a little weird. But uh, nonetheless, here they are. Right there. Yeah. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, I'm gonna see the goal. Yeah. 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 So within the three stars, I guess they were crediting the defense, which I guess is a good thing because, uh, you know, defense goes very underappreciated at times. And, uh, you know, it was a 14 save shutout and, you know, the defense has to have a hand in that. Uh, you will also note that uh, the announcer did say Kai Schwinn scored a goal, but uh, again, that goal has since been changed to Zach Lavoie. So those are the three stars. And here are some shots we, I took after the game. Yeah. Great shot, buddy. Thank you. Love the hat, too. <laughs> here, Norville, give me here, and I'll take a picture of the two of you. Oh, yeah. Hey. How you doing? How you doing? Oh, <laughs> see you. Yeah. Great game, great game. Great game, buddy. Welcome to the Donut Club. <laughs> See you next week, bud.
Well, great game up here, and now I can get in the car and cry about the Blue Jays. <laughs> and before I go, there is something I want to talk about that is pretty much inspired by the Blue Jays, but there is a Steelheads tie-in. Now, with being an athlete uh, comes a lot of expectations, uh, and some of them rightfully so, especially if you're a multi-million dollar athlete. You do expect Austin Matthews to have a good year every year. You expect, you know, Mitch Marner. You expect Bo Bichette. You expect Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Um, and uh, when those expectations don't get met, it's very easy for fans to jump down their throats. Uh, like when Bo Bichette makes an error, when Mitch Marner takes a critical penalty in the playoffs. Um, you know, it's happened. Uh, but I kind of credit this, my relationship with the Steelheads as a reason that I won't do that again. And the reason is this, like fans tend to look at the stat lines and, you know, have certain expectations tied to the stat lines. And, you know, if a player doesn't get a hit in a game, which happens to everyone, the longest hit streak in Major League history is 56. And there's a 162 game season. And 56 is not the standard, 56 is the Major League record. So players are going to go games without hits multiple times. It happens. And sometimes these comments just get dehumanizing. You're a bum because you didn't get a hit. You're a bum because you made an error. You're a bum because you tried to catch a fly ball with your face. That happened to a Blue Jays outfielder a couple years ago. It just gets so dehumanizing. And people forget that these are not stat lines on a computer. These are people. And, you know, whether you're a multi-million dollar athlete or whether you're a junior athlete, like on the Steelheads, like, you're human, you're not superhuman, you're not infallible, you're not flawless, things are going to happen. And here's the thing about Boba Shett, you know, when you play a position like shortstop, uh, you're going to make a ton of errors. Like, I don't think there's... If you're a shortstop and you have a full season with single-digit errors, you are an elite shortstop. And I know Boba Shett has made more than others... Uh, but uh, he's led the American League in hits, and people want to send him to the minors. Like, that that's just cuckoo bananas right there. They say that psychologically the best thing for an athlete to have after something like that happens is a short memory. Like, to be able to forget about it and move on. Uh, but, you know, when you have fans on social media, like, adding you and saying, reminding you of it, like, every day, and remember the one that happened last month, too, like, how do you expect someone to improve uh, when you keep bringing it up and constantly giving them that mental picture of failure? It's like that image, you know, remember in The Simpsons, you know, uh, when, like, the flashback when young Homer is doing gymnastics and, you know, he's doing really well, and then Grandpa yells, you're gonna blow it! Like, what do you think's gonna happen? <laughs> Same thing with the Leafs. I know in that Montreal series a couple years ago, there was a lot of criticism on Matthews and Marner for not being able to score on Carey Price enough. Um, saying, you know, Matthews and Martin are getting paid a lot of money to score. Carey Price is getting paid a lot of money for them not to score. So something's got to give. And a lot of people justify some of the dumb things they say by like, well, they need to do their job. What would happen if I didn't do my job? Well, competition is not like a regular job. Like if you work at McDonald's and someone tells you to make a burger, you make a burger. There's no challenge at all. There's not some Burger King employee standing next to you and putting his hands in trying to stop you from making a burger. Because that's what competition is. And isn't it interesting that we only have these conversations about the best players on the team? Like, not the fringe players who very often don't contribute as much and are often shuffled to the minors or cut, but the best players on the team. Like, the guys who usually do contribute, but once in a while have a human moment. Like, are they not allowed a human moment? Am I crazy here? Like, everyone loved Munenori Kawasaki way back then, uh, and no one seemed to care that he never actually did anything, but Bo Bichette's a terrible shortstop who needs to go to the minors? Like, what? It's good to have some expectations, like if Vladimir Guerrero Jr. hits six home runs all year, or Austin Matthews scores ten goals all year, then something's wrong. But you have to realize these guys are human, you know, they have things going on in their lives too uh, that aren't sports. Just don't be an ass to them. And nothing has taught me that athletes are human more than my interactions with the Steelheads. Like, if you're a fan, you're reading injury report, you see, oh, this guy sprained his ankle. Well, he doesn't exist for a while. Um, but if you're at a Steelheads game, you see this guy walking around on crutches. And, like, you're able to talk to them and say, hey, man, how's the ankle doing? Um, and that's not a sports question to me. That's a human question to me. Like, how are you doing? And knowing these guys personally, you learn that sports is a big part of what they do, but it's not their entire life. 
like these guys have other things going on. They have school, they have, you know, their own problems, like, you know, they've told me a few things, other things I'm sure they haven't, but like I've heard when their dogs have died, I've heard when their grandpas have died. And you know, that stuff doesn't stop happening just because they turn pro and you're not close enough to hear about it as much. This past Monday was Thanksgiving in Canada, but it was also World Mental Health Day, and it's easy to forget, you know? Everybody's got something going on. Just be kind. And as far as Thanksgiving goes, uh, I'm very thankful for all of my sports experiences. I've had many great ones, uh, even watching bad teams. Uh, and, uh, you know, topping the icing on the cake is my ability to become close with all the Steelheads players through the years. And I know that I've been kind of going at the business side of the team, you know, like a divorced couple lately, but... Uh, you know, when it comes to these kids, I have no intention of ever being a deadbeat dad. Anyway, this past week, the Steelheads pick up a big four points. And this coming week, the Steelheads have their first 3-3 three three weekend of the regular season. Friday, October 14th, they will be at the London Knights. And then they come home for a couple. Saturday, October 15th, the Oshawa Generals are in town. And then Sunday, October 16th, the Steelheads play host to the Sarnia Sting. I'll be at the home games. I will make an effort to be at the London game as well. Uh, it's a bit of a stretch after work, but uh, I will try to make it happen. Hope to see some of you guys at those games. In any case, the two wins this week were enough for Alessio Begari to pick up OHL Goaltender of the Week honors. Not bad for your second week in the league, eh? Congratulations, man. It's quite possible the Ryerson Angels will get a start in one of those three games, uh, possibly the middle one, but that's up to JR. Uh, of course, he had a rough uh, debut in the home opener, but if Leanders has a good game uh, when he gets another start, cheer him on. If he doesn't have such a great game, still cheer him on because uh, these guys need our support. Remember, be kind. Once again, I end by asking the OHL and CHL, please allow the fair use of your professional and amateur footage. Help the small media so they can help you. Until next time, you can find me behind the bench and only the bench. This is Jordan signing off. Bye-bye.